So welcome everyone. Here we go. Welcome everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us today for this rescheduled session. And thank you very much for your patience. I am delighted to host Dr. Jonathan Zachner Bernstein, whose study published in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease offers a new theory about the causes and potential treatments for Parkinson's, which of course has been a topic of big interest to everyone who suffers from the condition. I would like to start by reminding everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So if you're seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, you should really consult a medical professional. Um, as you can figure out through the, the screen that you see, there is a Q&A button at the bottom. Please enter your questions using that function. There will be time for questions at the end of this presentation. So just a few words about us for those who don't know us. Mark Lambert and I met at a tutorial, at a tutorial on nutrition and Parkinson's in the summer of 2020 and decided to stay in touch with a few other people. We named our small group No Silver Bullet, and that was a, basically a reflection of our belief that uh, we need a holistic approach to managing our symptoms, that not no one single solution is available, but there is an array of various solutions that we can tap into to help ourselves manage our, our symptoms. Uh, since then, we've been hosting external speakers every few weeks. And this is really to help us think holistically about the various ways of managing our symptoms. So in addition to our YouTube channel that we mentioned a second ago, uh, this is where we post the recordings of our sessions. We also have an Instagram page and a Twitter feed. The details are in the chat. But let's come back to today's topic. Motivated by friends suffering from Parkinson's, Dr. Zachar Bernstein decided to look more closely at the disease and focused on the gap in our understanding. Actually, no one had so far measured the amount of dopamine in the dopaminergic neurons of people with Parkinson's. And this is critically important because dopamine can be toxic to these cells, which would then be a driver of neuron dysfunction and death, leading to disease progression. Jonathan published his analysis last summer in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease, and he showed that these critical neurons do not like dopamine. They actually have excess dopamine which led, this is something that led him to design a clinical trial to test a drug that addresses this newly defined mechanism of disease. Jonathan was a renewed, a renowned clinical trialist in cardiology before leaving academics to pursue medical product development. He served as an associate director of the FDA Device Center, where he led diverse programs under collaboration with DARPA. After serving at the FDA, Jonathan consulted for DARPA and supported the launch of their Biological Technologies Office, with a primary focus on neuroscience and big data programs. Jonathan's academic experience ranges, ranges from first in human to international trials, both as a clinical investigator and a trial leader. We're very fortunate to be able to listen to you today, but Jonathan, the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Mark. And, and I appreciate everyone taking the time to join this conversation today. Um, I'm going to bring up the slides, if you give me a moment. We've all been there, or at a minimum, we can imagine the situation. Faced with the prospect of suffering from a degenerative disease, we yearn to find a way to change our fate or the fate of our loved ones. Those of you who are scientists on this call today may recall how Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin and hope for such fortune. Or perhaps you hope your doctor sees something that others can't the way Edward Jenner noticed how dairy workers who contracted cowpox were immune to smallpox, leading to the development of a smallpox vaccine. Perhaps you bring in articles to your doctor asking whether a report offers promise. Perhaps you search the reports of how changing your diet or taking a supplement could change your fate. In each case, the motivator is to address the risk of disability, of suffering. I faced a similar situation. My buddy Ivan was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and I watched as his condition started to worsen. So as a doctor, albeit a cardiologist and not a neurologist, I asked myself, what if I could discover 
the silver bullet for Ivan for Parkinson's disease. To do so, I would need to teach myself about the disease and available treatments. And what did I learn? Well, for current treatments, there really have been no major advances since the 1970s. All of these therapies focused on dopaminergic stimulation or dopaminergic support are palliative, affecting symptoms, and none are shown to affect clinical progression or clinical worsening. So then I defined the process I would follow. How could I tackle this in a way that gave a chance for a meaningful impact and a meaningful discovery? Well, first, uh, what I would do to evaluate the possibilities is I would resort back to first principles, the foundational assumptions underlying disease understanding. Next, I would apply systems analysis, a set of disciplines learned as an undergraduate studying engineering. And then I would look for parallels to other settings with the perspective that perhaps a solution is possible based on the work of others. I'm going to share the highlights of my path using this three-step process. And I'm sure in many ways it will raise more questions that we can discuss afterwards uh, or at a separate session. But again, the first principle that I attacked initially is that Parkinson's is a state of dopamine deficiency, as this is the basis for virtually all the therapies developed since the 1970s. So that leads to the question, if Parkinson's is a disease of dopamine deficiency, why don't dopaminergic therapies change the course of disease since they replace dopamine? Well, we know that dopaminergic therapies do not fix the disease. So then a related question would be getting back to the very basis of our understanding is whether dopaminergic neurons are actually dopamine deficient. And of course, that's what seems to be proven true based on textbooks and standard of practice. In order to address these two questions and really start to focus on the second, uh, I started with the papers that established the current model published in the early to mid 1960s by a Swiss group who published all of these observations in German. Now, I don't know how many of you are fluent in German, but you can imagine that it requires some insight in order to really tease apart detailed scientific papers that are considered the foundation of our assumption that we lack dopamine in Parkinson's disease. Well, let's take a look at what these studies taught. Um, in any paper, uh, the results are typically pretty easy to understand when they're presented in table form or graphical form. So as an example, here's a table taken out of the first publication and you know, numbers are numbers, and the, the Latin names for anatomic structures are the same, whether written in a paper in German or in English or in Spanish. You can look at the top and it doesn't says who it's in, but it doesn't have the word Parkinson's. So we can infer that this is from normals. We can see that the regions of the brain of interest relating to Parkinson's are easy to identify. The levels are easy to identify of dopamine. That's at the top of this. So we can extract these numbers and draw a set of conclusions. But scientists know that the key part of any study is the method section. And if you don't know German, understanding the nuances here is much more difficult. My advantage over people of my age group who started out in training as neurologists and Parkinson's experts is I'm starting now in an era where I can use Google Translate. They didn't have that. So believe it or not, of the four landmark papers that were published in German in the 60s, only one has ever been republished in English. So I went back to see what these papers actually measured by dissecting out the methods. And here's a way that people would look at this. You can see the three of the, the first three papers are listed here, the amount of dopamine in normal brains and in Parkinson's brains. And you see that basically the amount of dopamine in Parkinson's brain is reported to be about 
of normal in the caudate and 7% in the putamen. Okay, so now we understand why the conclusion has been drawn and why all of investigation is based on the fact that dopamine is deficient in the basal ganglia. I'd like to explain um, for a moment um, why scientific methods matter in this particular setting. And I'm gonna try to do this with an analogy that I think is fair um, and, and hopefully will help communicate what I observed as I started to, to tear apart these data and the methods of these studies. Let's say it's a parallel situation where we're interested in the economic standing of a community and that we have a way to measure the amount of money that is in savings in every household. Maybe it's in every building. So if we take the total amount of money and divide it by the number of buildings, we would theoretically know what the average amount of financial reserves, financial security is for each family. But if in fact, when we did the calculations, our methods were such that we counted every building and we didn't discern between a bank building and a single family house, well, that bank building would have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in reserve and would throw the average off for the entire community, making the community appear wealthier than it actually is. And so the key here is that if you wanna know how, how secure financially a community is at the level of a family, your methods have to include only measures from the families, not from every building that could include a bank or a business or a credit union. And that's the same problem that happened in these particular studies and those that followed when people were measuring dopamine. They were measuring dopamine in the entire region of a brain instead of what's inside the individual neurons. And I'm gonna to explain to you why it's important to know what's going on inside the neurons. The reason is, and this is probably gonna be a topic that people are gonna to wanna to dig into, is that when dopamine is freely floating within the cytoplasm, within the cell body of a dopaminergic neuron, it is toxic to these cells, primarily through its breakdown products, but also through direct effects. This is not controversial. We know that if we take cells in the lab and we do these measurements, dopamine is toxic. We don't know, and there's not proof, as to how this manifests in a person over a long period of time. But on a scientific basis, we know that dopamine is toxic. We also know, getting back to this analogy with the wealth of families, that if dopamine is outside the cells, is extracellular, it does not damage the cells. It does not damage the mitochondria in the cells, which is basically the part of a cell that produces all its energy, and it's necessary for the cell to function, and it does not affect cell viability. So extracellular dopamine doesn't really matter if we're trying to understand its role in disease severity or progression. So tissue dopamine is not the most important variable, even though all of the science, all of the therapies, have been based on the assumption that those tissue levels reflected what the cells were experiencing at the site of their toxicity. So what we need to know is dopamine in the cytosol, in the cell body, in order to understand exactly what's going on. So to, to, to figure that out, I went back to the literature and said, what do we know about the amount of dopamine inside the neurons of people suffering from Parkinson's disease? And what I found is that the amount of intracellular dopamine is not reported from any clinical study, any samples uh, from autopsies, nowhere, neither by direct measurement or by indirect calculation. And I, I actually found some people have done some measurements of dopamine in animal cells, not from Parkinson's models, because not there's no publication in Parkinson's models and tried to talk to them about how easy or hard it would be to do that and, and really was not able to get a lot of traction. But clearly 
no data. So I had to try to figure out how to understand how much dopamine was inside the cells. And the way I did that was by a review of the literature that showed that all of the components were necessary to do the calculation. Now it's not just, you know, dividing A by B by C and you have your answer. There's some modeling, there's some statistics, there's some meta-analysis methods that I was able to, to, to bring to this, this question. But what I found was that indirect calculation is actually pretty straightforward mathematically because you can account, you start out with the tissue dopamine, you account for the number of, or reduction in number of dopaminergic neurons, the reduction in number of axon terminals, and the reduction as well as dysfunction of the vesicles inside the neurons, which are critical for holding those, securing those, um, and, and also involved with neurotransmission, the signals uh, spread from one nerve to another using dopamine. So by doing that, um, then this was the paper that, that um, Michelle mentioned that I published in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease this, this past summer. What I learned is that cytosolic dopamine is not reduced. It, 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 it is, if anything, elevated. And, and here is the data. Compared to cytosolic dopamine in the brains of people without Parkinson's, in the caudate, Parkinson's patients have almost, have about 89% more cytosolic dopamine than normals. And you see the p-value is, a, is a, a trend, statistical trend. And in, in the um, putamen, it's 460% higher. And here you'll see it's highly statistically significant. Included in this analysis was breaking down these studies by whether the patients were on any therapy or not. And it basically showed the same result, whether they were on some sort of dopaminergic therapy or not, because dopaminergic therapy was starting in the mid 60s in some of these studies and became standard of care in the mid 1970s. So what we know with this first analysis uh, of how much dopamine is inside the cells, which is critical to determining whether dopamine plays a toxic role, a mechanistic role, whether we should supplement it for the sake of the cells or not, is that dopamine is not deficient for the dopaminergic neurons from their perspective. Those average, the average neuron has excess dopamine and therefore Parkinson's is a disease of dopamine excess in the dopaminergic neurons, not of dopamine deficiency. Now, that may seem a little, a little tough to swallow, especially for those of you who are familiar with the fact that if you take levodopa or you take a dopamine agonist or, or, or MALB inhibitor, et cetera, that you can experience a prompt improvement in symptoms. Now, that doesn't last for years in most people, but it certainly happens. You take the dose, you feel better. You can move better. That's the typical experience in Parkinson's. So, so how can this be? If I'm saying dopamine is bad, how could, let's just say, for the sake of discussion, I'll talk about it from a levodopa point of view. Well, how does levodopa actually do good? And, and really uh, applying systems analysis and pharmacology insights tell us why. So let's talk about systems analysis. This is typical of what doctors like me like to do. We like to put on these complex figures. I'm sorry for that, but what I'm gonna do here is focus on a couple areas. You see the top part is the presynaptic axon terminal. The bottom part is the postsynaptic dendrite. What I want you to focus on here is first of all, this red circle, L-tyrosine is converted to L-dopa by TH, tyrosine hydroxylase. Tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate limiting enzyme in the formation of dopamine, this particular step right here. I'm gonna to touch back on that in a few slides. The second thing to notice is here you have DA, which represents a few hundred thousand molecules of dopamine inside this little ball, which is a vesicle. Some of you may heard, have heard of something called VMAP2, which is a protein that enables the vesicle to form and function. Dopamine is sequestered inside these vesicles and that's what prevents it from being toxic. It's only toxic when it's floating around in the cytoplasm. 
not when it's held inside the vesicle. Vesicles eventually uh, attach at the surface, they open up and they let dopamine come out, okay? Where it then um, will bind uh, at a, here showing the dopamine one receptor, there is five dopamine receptors really categorized mostly as type one like or type two like. And you see there's something here called a G protein. Um, and, and this is G protein mediated receptor means that the dopamine attaches here and through the G protein sends a signal that tells this cell whether to be excited or whether to be inhibited, active or off. Um, G proteins mediated receptors are all over the place, including the heart and throughout the body on your white blood cells that fight infection. Um, and so they're extremely well understood. And it's their pharmacologic principles that tell us why levodopa works. So here's the kind of curve that people who study pharmacology like to show. They usually have it with all sorts of little numbers and figures and all that sort of stuff on it. So I'm stripping it down just to show that the relationship for dopamine for a G protein coupled receptor, you see as you go up on the dopamine to the right, there's not much of an increase up and down. And eventually you get past the curve and there's a steep section so that as you go up on dopamine a little bit, there's a big difference in receptor activation. And then you get to the point where the receptor is completely saturated with dopamine and you can keep going up on the dopamine and it basically doesn't go above 95%, okay? So in the normal person, the cells are operating down here. And very small changes in dopamine wouldn't do much, but there's nice dynamic range. This is a very active system, can put out millions of dopamine molecules at a time, which is enough to cause an increase in receptor activation and things happen. In Parkinson's, you give levodopa and the base, the average dopamine level shifts to the right from the red circle to the green circle. And now it's still on the curve. And you can see that by operating up here, going even letting a little bit of dopamine out can cause nice receptor activation. So you're not really changing the active um, dynamic nature of dopamine neurotransmission by giving levodopa you're shifting up on the curve to a spot where a very small amount of dopamine being released can have impact and that's why levodopa would appear to work based on a systems anal analysis and pharmacologic principles now i hope this isn't getting too far into the weeds but i i did want to make sure i took some time to show you that the model of dopamine being in excess in Parkinson's is completely compatible with the fact that levodopa or other dopaminergic agents work for symptomatic relief acutely after a dose and for a period of what could be months to years before the effect starts to wane. Because the other thing about G protein coupled receptors is that they get desensitized over time. The, the last part of, of the analysis that led me to this approach is by drawing parallels. And one of the things I realized as I started to read about Parkinson's was that it was strikingly similar to the work I did as an academic cardiologist with a class of medicines called beta blockers as a treatment for congestive heart failure or chronic heart failure. Now, at the time I started doing this work in the early 90s, Beta blockers were contraindicated. They had a label um, uh, in their approval from every country that said, don't use beta blockers because if you give them to a heart failure patient in the standard dose, by the end of the day, you'll have them in the emergency department because their symptoms will worsen. But a few cardiologists in Sweden actually thought, well, maybe the problem is how much is being dosed at a time and so they started out with about a 10th or 20th of the dose and gradually increased over the course of weeks to months. And what they were able to show was that all these patients tolerated the beta blocker quite nicely and seemed to have improvement in their heart function and their symptoms. 
I was fortunate enough to uh, be starting a, the first phase two trial of a beta blocker for heart fair, where again, we saw the same thing, starting at a low dose, gradually going up, um, allowing the body to respond over the course of a few months, as opposed to expecting an effect over a few minutes, led to the appearance of data that showed that the drug slowed, halted, and in some cases reversed disease progression. And now beta blockers are standard of care for heart failure. So um, uh, what, what I just summarized was their, their similarities. They are um, really do have related peptides, dopamine in Parkinson's and norepinephrine, which is synthesized from dopamine in heart failure. Um, if you give too much, you're gonna make somebody sicker in all probability. Um, you, if you look at the laboratory data for each, what you show is that antagonizing that, that the respective peptide improves the biology and function in a number of cell models. Um, and then eventually in heart failure, the drugs are proven to work. Um, and, and I think that that's the same kind of thing we could see if we pick the right therapy to block the toxic effects of dopamine in patients with Parkinson's disease. So um, while levodopa enhances neurotransmission across the synapse, the dopaminergic neurons are not dopamine deficient. I'm sorry to be redundant, but it's important for me to emphasize that they have excess dopamine. And excess dopamine is toxic to dopaminergic neurons, supporting the importance of testing therapies that will reduce cytosolic dopamine. That's right. Uh, what, what I'm advocating is based on preclinical data and careful review of these foundational studies about Parkinson's and show that it is scientifically rational to treat Parkinson's with drugs that reduce intracellular dopamine. So, um, Really, as, as I think about this, it's, it, it's certainly, unfortunately, is too late for Ivan, but perhaps not too late for you and for others. And so what I wanna do is share the data um, that show how reducing dopamine addresses the pathologic processes that are experienced by dopaminergic neurons. A drug previously used in the US, but to date not approved in the UK for a rare cancer complication is shown to work in two preclinical models of Parkinson's disease by blocking tyrosine hydroxylase. I mentioned tyrosine hydroxylase earlier. That's the rate limiting enzyme that um, involved in the formation of dopamine. So that's by blocking that would be a very logical way to attack this problem. Now, you may say, how can I be so confident that this is logical? Well, before we got into the days of looking at genes and editing genes and using cell therapies and programming cell therapies, almost all of our treatments were either to block the effect of something at a hormone or block the rate limiting enzyme. So rate limiting enzymes are used widely. Uh, most antibiotics affect rate limiting enzymes that determine whether a bacteria lives or dies. Anti-HIV meds are all about attacking rate limiting enzymes. The most widely prescribed class of high blood pressure medicines, ACE inhibitors, Box rate limiting enzyme. Um, Viagra, one of the most successful drugs ever developed in terms of how, how much people want to keep using it, is again an enzyme inhibitor. And the class of stat, the statins are all, again, enzyme inhibitors of the rate limiting step. So this is a very well known, effective way that we can modulate how the drugs can work that we're gonna to use to try to reduce dopamine levels in the cells. So the drug itself is called Matyrosine. In the US, the trade name is Denzer. Uh, it was approved in 1979 for treatment of hypertension due to dopamine excess from a kind of tumor that makes huge amounts of dopamine. So a, a systemic dopamine toxicity. And this drug does penetrate the blood-brain barrier and is shown in a number of studies to have effects on dopamine synthesis in the brain. High doses are required for patients with real chromocytoma between 250 and a gram uh, four times a day. 
in parallel to the beta blocker with heart failure experience I alluded to before, I would not advocate using high dose. And to be honest, I don't know what is too high a dose quite yet. That's what we want to test in the first study is identify a low enough dose where there's no side effects and then gradually increase. So I mentioned that matyrosine works. Most um, drugs that are developed for a disease go through a whole series of preclinical study, toxicology studies, drug interaction studies, genotoxicity, which affects the things that affect the genes. Um, then they go into phase one studies where the drug is seen how, to, how it gets absorbed, how it interacts, how it's broken down. Um, basically all that stuff's been done with matyrosine. So it literally can go right into a phase two clinical trial here in the US. So in terms of matyrosine, let me just briefly show you these two studies. One uh, is published in the journal Science. You don't get a paper into a better journal than Science. I mean, that's probably one of the top two or three journals for scientific publications in the world. And they use something called IPS cells. We were discussing those with Roger Barker in the last session induced pluripotent stem cells, which you make from taking a skin biopsy on somebody and then treat it, and you can turn it into dopaminergic neurons for that same person. Um, so IPS cells uh, were obtained from people with spontaneous PD and genetic PD, a DJ1 homozygous um, population, as well as people without Parkinson's disease. And what they showed in these subcultures that lasted from two to six months is that oxidative stress was reduced with matyrosine, that alpha synuclein deposition was reduced with matyrosine, and that dopaminergic neuron survival was improved with matyrosine. The effects were seen within about 60 to 90 days um, in the DJ1 mutant iPS cells from DJ1 mutant. Parkinson's patients. And in the sporadic patients, it took about 120 to 150 days. So it was a little slower before the toxicity showed up as well as the benefit showing up, but showed it in both populations. In a study of journal biological chemistry a couple of years earlier, a mouse model, the MTPT mouse model was used. And what this showed was dopaminergic neuron survival was improved with batyrosine therapy in this model. So two well uh, documented and accepted scientific models of Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I can't show you anything that didn't work because there's no model using matyrosine that didn't work. It's two for two, which is pretty good. Um, for those of you who like uh, graphical representation, you can see that about uh, a 0.6 fold drop in, in oxidized dopamine and alpha synuclein deposition, and about a one and a half fold increase in neuron. Uh, viability. So if I'm so confident uh, with the use of matyrosine to that, the, that the use of matyrosine to reduce dopamine levels will help, um, you may wonder why I don't already have a list of study sites ready for you to approach for enrollment. Uh, well, what I'd like to do is explain some of the barriers, which I'm working on. Um, the first is it clinically, uh, I think I figured out the right dosing regimen. Um, I have submitted uh, uh, and engaged with the FDA over the last nine months about the approach I wanna take, a uh, clinical trial design, dosing regimen. They seem to be comfortable with the dosing regimen that I proposed, which is again, very low at the beginning and increasing at weekly intervals. Uh, I'm pretty close to a formal agreement with the FDA, but there's some work that they asked me to do in a submission. That work will also require me to secure a source of drug. So either I have to start manufacturing or figure out how I can buy it from a source when there really isn't much to buy. So, because again, it's for a very unusual condition. Um, so I'm, I'm working on those. In terms of the regulatory summary, as I mentioned, I'm seeking the FDA permission to launch a clinical trial. I expect that I could have that uh, request in within the next few months. Um, and that generally, I think that'll probably take, probably by the end of the year, I could get, get that trial approved. Um, uh, of course, that still requires me to get money. I can do this work. 
Uh, it doesn't cost to submit this to the FDA, uh, but but to actually do the work after getting FDA clearance to start the trial requires a pretty substantial amount of money. Uh, and that includes money to establish drug manufacturing or secure supply. So that's why the financial issues are really the biggest barrier. And I've been out um, trying to raise money for the last couple of years. Most investors do not like to invest in repurposed drugs because they feel like the business model is not their usual. Um, so when I asked for $10 million to complete phase two, um, it's, it's hard to get people to, to uh, make a commitment. I've had a few that have started to do a little diligence, but have not been able to close that and continuing to work on that. So in terms of the development process that I see over the next three to four years, um, you know, preclinical validation is already done. Preclinical toxicology is already done. To find the metabolism and drug interactions through phase one trials already done. Submitting the pre-IND already done. I'm currently working on the final design for the phase two clinical trials. Then I'll have to continue to work on site selection, although I already have identified um, three Parkinson's uh, investigators who are interested in being part of a trial. Um, I've got to uh, then of course, execute the trials, and I've, I've done that before, working for uh, companies, working in academics, so I'm confident I can get the operations in place. Once that happens, there's something called an end of phase two meeting that you have with the FDA to define what the endpoints would be and what the trials need to look like for phase three. Those have to be performed. You complete those, submit a new drug application, which generally takes somewhere between nine to 12 months and then it's commercially available. So a lot of steps. Um, once uh, funding would be secured, I would expect that um, within three to four years, I can certainly get through the phase, end of phase two meeting. And I think with positive data, it'd be really easy to get the money for phase three, even though you know, you're talking nine figures of investment um, uh, with a drug that actually showed it could have an impact on people with Parkinson's disease through a novel mechanism, there would be a lot of excitement. So uh, what ends up happening a lot of times when I'm talking to people is they ask me what the key challenge is. Um, and it's really pretty simple. I'd also need to make sure that I provide the, the proper warnings. It would be a mistake and potentially a life-threatening mistake for any of you to go home and call your doctor to start treatment with metiracine. We need to do the studies that demonstrate metiracine works, and if so, how to make it work, work safely. So there are several warnings that I just wanna make sure you're paying attention to. The scientific studies and peer-reviewed data strongly support launching the investigation of metiracine as a treatment for Parkinson's disease. A phase two clinical trial could be launched within a year of securing funding. And over a hundred failures that I've experienced pitching VC funds, angel investors and foundations, uh, well, I'm not gonna let them define me or this project because the key thing I keep asking myself is what if metiracine is the silver bullet? Because I believe that this discovery is a silver bullet for Parkinson's disease. It won't be a cure. But the science suggests that using metiracine can slow, stop, or reverse the clinical worsening that appears to be the destiny of people like Ivan and many of you who have Parkinson's. The trial won't start this week, but it could start this year. And I plan to complete it quickly and with the highest quality so that hopefully we'll learn that the drug will be useful for you. It's what the data say is more than just a possibility. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very, very much for this fascinating presentation and definitely talk stimulating. Thank you very much. Um, for questions, and I see that some of you have already posted your questions on the q and I'm just engaging those who haven't done it yet and have questions to look at the bottom of your screen. There is a section that says Q&A. This is where you can post your questions. Before we go through those questions, Mark, we got a couple of questions from people who were unable to join. I think Audrey and Anne, would you like to take us through those? <laughs> 
And then Michelle, I'll, I'll just copy and paste the first one in there, please. In the question, is levodopa medication toxic to neurons? It also is known to raise, can't remember that word, which is toxic to the brain and the heart. What was your view on that, Jonathan? I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. I'm having trouble hearing. The audio is not great. Could you try that again? Can you, can you see the chat? Yes. I've just typed the question into the chat just so it's clear. Thank you. Copied it from the previous. Um, where, I mean, there's a lot in the chat. I'm sorry. Where, where, where okay, in the chat? Late, latest. There you go. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, the question is whether it is, it is, is uh, a request to confirm that what I'm saying is that L-dopa medication is toxic to neurons. So what I can tell you is that when neurons are, are taken from animal models of Parkinson's disease in a laboratory um, and then in isolation, so they don't have the whole system there that can potentially have com compensatory factors that we, I don't even, that nobody understands, but when you take those cells out of animal models in a lab and expose them to dopamine or L-dopa, you will see evidence of toxicity. Now, is that something, and, and, I, and I wanna be careful here because I find that the way those papers are written doesn't seem like the authors have any questions that they're raising in their mind as to whether this is actual toxicity. But if you talk to Parkinson's experts in the clinical arena, what they'll tell you is we've had people and studies that have said L-DOPA is toxic. And it's gone back and forth over the last 30 or 40 years where if you go back through the history, what you'll see is that there was a time where people would advocate for levodopa holidays, that you wanted to take patients who, were, who had Parkinson's disease on levodopa, stop them for a few months, and then to give them a holiday, let this, the body recover, and then start up again. Um, there are some clinical studies that experts will say demonstrate that L-DOPA is not toxic. And therefore, these laboratory data, although there's no controversy about what they show, aren't relevant to what's going on clinically. I don't believe that the studies that those experts are citing to, as, to disprove that L-DOPA has potential toxicity are valid ways to prove that point because they're just not designed in a way to test that. As an example, in cardiology, when we were concerned about the equivalent, something, you know, basically a beta agonist instead of a beta blocker, studies were done with two or 3,000 people followed for two or three years. And those showed that those drugs had toxicity, clinical toxicity. In Parkinson's disease, the, there are two placebo-controlled trials with levodopa, neither one longer than nine months, neither one of them bigger than a few hundred people. They just, they aren't big enough to detect a problem if there's one there. So while I believe dopamine and L-dopa have potential for toxicity, I do not, I cannot stand next to a Parkinson's expert like Roger Barker, who was here last time, and convince him that I'm right, even though I, I think I could convince him that it's good to explore this approach because the data say this is approach is scientifically rational. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, if you don't mind joining me in just checking the questions on the Q&A, if you can do this with me, that would prevent me from having to read sometimes quite lengthy question, not the first one from Christie is quite short. Uh, Christy is asking us, what does dopamine toxicity look like in a healthy person? In a healthy person? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the relevance would be of that. I mean, we're talking about what's going on in Parkinson's. Um, so uh, if the person is asking me, what does dopamine toxicity look like in a Parkinson's patient who's starting out relatively well, yes. what I would say is that I believe, but I cannot prove, and I don't want to be quoted as saying this is absolute truth, but I believe that we will eventually learn when proper studies are done, clinic, when proper clinical trials are done, that L-dopamine does improve symptoms in the short run, but exerts toxicity over the long run and is a contributor to disease progression. Now, if, if there's a Parkinson's clinician, a neurologist on, the, on this call, uh, she or he is going to be jumping up and down wanting to get on this conversation saying that 
I'm being irresponsible by making that statement. Yes. I'm trying to qualify it by saying, I believe that that's what clinical trials would show. What I can say with 100% certainty is that there is no clinical trial that has been performed to date with levodopa or any other dopaminergic therapy that's placebo controlled, that's designed in a way that could prove that those therapies are safe that could designed in a way that can prove that those therapies don't potentially worsen the natural history of disease. They just haven't been done. Thank you very much. We have a question from Randy, if you don't mind having a look. He's asking us about the method. I'm looking for Randy's right now, I'm sorry. Yes, the first one on top. Okay, wait a second. I think I'm looking at the chat instead of the Q&A. In the Q&A, in the Q&A. Okay. Open questions, first one. I can read it if you want. Yeah, I'm just having okay. trouble getting off of the- Okay, so, so it's quite a lengthy question. Let me just read it to you. How were you able to establish a method of measuring the number of dopaminergic cells still alive in the living Parkinson's brain to calculate the, the cytolytic dopamine being excessive from norm? He thinks that the method would seem very difficult to validate. And secondly, he's asking if a dop dopamine tracer DAT, that, that scan shows diminished dopamine in the neuron how does that correspond with your findings? Okay, yeah, I mean, to, to create a method to count neurons is really, really complicated and really hard. And just to go through a little more detail how I did it, I relied on peer-reviewed publications that had done this. So in, in the peer-reviewed literature, I, I don't remember the exact number, I'm sorry, I think there were seven or eight papers that measure the number of neuron cell bodies. And they measure them by staining for specific components that are seen in dopaminergic neuron cell bodies. And then um, using a standardized um, magnification and a standardized number of fields and a standardized shift in how deeply they went up and down as they looked at those fields, they came up with a number and calculated the number as a ratio using the same methods between dope brains from patients who had died with Parkinson's and undergone autopsy um, and normals, age, same age, again, who had died and undergone autopsy and they were able to get mm -hmm. brain tissue from each of those populations. So these are methods that have been validated for which there's great literature. Um, they uh, are validated for measurement of tissue dopamine. They're validated for number of cell bodies. They're validated for the number of axon terminals. They're validated for the amount of VMAT2 protein as a surrogate for how many vesicles there are. So those were the four parameters that were used to do the calculation. And then it's standard math using meta-analysis methods. Thank you very much, Anthem. Uh, jo Milne is a lady who can smell Parkinson's. She suffers from a condition that just allows her to detect Parkinson's through the smell. And she basically says that actually uh, from the volatiles that she can smell, they have discovered with the University of Manchester, if I remember well, that there are some dysregulated levels in most mitochondria in the body uh, in terms of cardiolipids and different types of glyco glycolipids and others. Will this address the problem? Will the, the drug that we're talking about address the problem? Well, one of the things that we see in people with Parkinson's um, who are the, the exact kind that were the basis of these studies that allowed me to draw the conclusion that the levels are in excess, not deficient within the neurons, is that when dopamine is in the cytosol, in the cell body, and then gets broken down in the cell body and forms these metabolites, one of them, the main effects is the toxicity on the mitochondria. So mitochondria drop out. And that's really what's, what's I think the major reason for disease progression is that as you lose the mitochondria and you've got these dopaminergic neurons that are amongst the, the most metabolically intensive requiring cells in the body with thousands of branches of these axons all interconnected, um, they lose a little bit of their mitochondria, which are producing the energy that keeps all this neurotransmission going. You lose the axons. You lose the neurotransmission. So yeah, I, I think that if we can knock down enough of the 
dopamine, um, we will reduce the levels of oxidized dopamine. And with less oxidized dopamine and breakdown products of dopamine, we should spare mitochondria. Will we restore them to normal? I, I think that would maybe, maybe you, you, you'd get upset with me saying this is a silver bullet, but it's not a gold bullet. You know, a gold <laughs> bullet would restore them. I'm just thinking we have a silver bullet that can reverse this process. Thank you, Jonathan. Another question from Randy, actually, who is asking uh, the following question. Are there not already patients who are taking drugs like metarazine to, that already have PD and, and where we would have seen an effect of the drug on their, on their condition? An excellent question. So this was one of the first things that I thought, especially because if you were to read the product label for metarazine, it does have a warning about the drug worsening Parkinson's. Um, which would be appropriate if you took a dose of 250 milligrams or a gram and you had Parkinson's, I think you'd probably be in the emergency room later that day or the next day. Um, so the first thing I did was I went to the FDA's FAIRS database, which is a database that records spontaneous reports of adverse events. Couldn't find anything, um, uh, not one report of a Parkinson's patient taking the tyrosine. Um, Then I contacted the medical affairs department of Bausch Health here in the US. Bausch Health is the company that owns Metiracine. They didn't develop it. It was actually developed by Merck back in the 70s, but Bausch Health owns it now. Bausch Health's medical affairs department did a search on all their case reports and came back to me and told me that they had not one report of a Parkinson's patient taking Metiracine or could they, neither could they give me even a report of somebody taking Metiracine who develop Parkinsonian symptoms. Um, so uh, uh, those were the two best ways I could do it. I did also manage to convince um, a drug research group to, um, to do a search of whether they had any evidence of metyrosine prescriptions being filled in people who took Parkinson's drugs. And they found like three or four um, and none of them were refilled and they had no way of telling me whether they were adverse events or not. So I've tried to figure out if there's any real world data of metyrosine in Parkinson's patients, and I've hit the dead ends. Thank you for trying, uh, Jonathan. A question from Ali is basically asking whether you have any concerns that metyrosine might worsen motor symptoms in patients as it will deplete dopamine, even if the, in the long term it slows down the progression. Um, well. I mean, the, the one thing that I'm very comfortable saying is I worry about everything. So yes, I worry about that. Um, and I think that that's why um, I've spent a, an incredible amount of time going through pharmacology papers from the 70s and 80s to try to figure out in both animals and people to figure out what dose I would be comfortable wouldn't do anything and then cutting the dose further. So there's a whole bunch of studies. And in fact, I, I was able to get the medical review by the FDA from 1979 through a freedom of information request. It took about six months before it showed up, but that was incredibly valuable as well because with, between that review and all the data in it and what's published in the literature, you, you, can, you can see that um, there's a dose that the likelihood of it doing anything is is pretty close, seems pretty close to zero. I mean, God, you know, God knows it could do something bad. And that's why I tell people, don't, don't try this at home. It really should be done under a very, very controlled environment. Um, and that the way I would say this controlled environment, not just picking the dose right, but in the way I've written the protocol is every time somebody takes a dose, the next highest dose is in the clinic and they have to stay in the clinic for three hours under observation after they take the first dose in that level. Mm -hmm. So am I worried? Yes. Do I believe I figured out the ways to mitigate that risk? Yes, because say they get into trouble in three hours, I give them some droxydopa or some levodopa and it should reverse because the pharmacology is not an irreversible 100% blockade of, the, of that enzyme. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, Mark is asking a question about um, potential post-mortem analysis that would have measured dopamine in the cells. Uh, um, it's a good question actually, because why would we not just do it? Isn't that, isn't that amazing that nobody's ever done it? I, I found that the one study that I found that was really, really terrific um, was a study that looked at intracellular dopamine levels in cells that, are, that have some dopamine. They're, they're similar to dopaminergic cells a little bit, PC12 cell line, but um, 
not in people. And I contacted that author and I said, oh my God, this could be so cool. Let me tell you about this paper I just submitted. I think it's going to get published. You could do like a great study. You should, you should use your, your PC12 method in some human brains. Maybe I can help you somehow. I don't know. And basically uh, what I learned was that um, uh, experimental prep was so complicated that they used it. It was very hard. Um, I think that they were, um, they were convinced that unless there was going to be some big series of studies that they just couldn't keep it up and keep it working. So they don't even have a setup anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think this would be an amazing study to do. But by the time you found somebody to do it, um, and by the time you, you got going, I, I could have the answer faster by giving the intervention. Sure. Thank you, Jonathan. Just, just a comment to our audience, because I see, I think that some people have been posting questions on the chat. If you don't mind, cut and paste your question in the chat, if that's the case, and put it in the Q&A where I'm handling them so that I don't have to toggle between one and the other, if you don't mind, if I can ask you, please, to do this. Going back to the questions, Audrey is asking probably the most, the most basic question at all that everyone has on the back of their mind. Should PWPs avoid LDOPA meds then? Well, Audrey, if I could get funded within um, two years, I'll be able to answer that question. Good. Well, actually, I'm just thinking you're looking for $10 million. We have, we have 10 million Parkinson's patients in the world. We should be able to match both. There you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll set up a profit sharing plan for everybody who gets that. <laughs> a comment from Joy, who was asking about mitochondria. It's not a question, it's just a comment to say that in 1922, the red seller and Frederick Louis of the famous Louis bodies wrote uh, about this mitochondrial dysfunction and toxicity, but it was a paper that was squashed. As you like, uh, you like looking back at old papers, you might just have to look at that one if you haven't already. I am definitely going to pull that one. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, yes, a question from John, o, John Mo, who is asking basically, is there a natural form of metarotine in, uh, that we could basically access through dietary supplements? You know, if there were a, and I don't know if, I don't know the answer to the question, but if there were, um, and it was chemically likely to be effective against the enzyme, the way metyrosine is, I would find it to be no more comforting than just metyrosine. Um, it, we're, the goal here is to figure out how to block the enzyme. And I don't mean 100%. I mean, one of the things about metyrosine that I like which I've had some pharmacology people tell me is a, is a weakness, is that it can't block tyrosine hydroxylate 100%. The highest any study attempt, they did, studies are done when drugs are developed to say, you know, at what level do you get to 50%? At what level do you get to 100%? And what ends up happening is you see how effectively you can block an enzyme. This can only block it at 65%. That's the maximum it can go. Mm. So. I actually think that's good because you want to have some tyrosine hydroxylase function. You still need some dynamic activity. Uh, if you were to take a dietary supplement that only gave you 5%, I, I doubt that's going to be enough. You might as well not take it. Um, if on the other hand, 5% inhibition turns out is enough to make somebody worse and we really should have started out at 1%, well, I, I wouldn't make myself the, you know, sort of, um, the guinea pig number one without it being very controlled and without having some understanding of what that natural mm -hmm. supplement might actually do uh, in terms of its potency relative to metyrosine. Thank you. A follow-up question from John Moe who's asking whether there is a biomarker for presence of metyrosine. Um, I'm not sure that I understand where you're going out. I mean, the, um, to a biomarker to see whether you've got taken enough metyrosine. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, biomarkers, uh, I, I just don't understand the question. I'm sorry, maybe you can rephrase Actually, it. Actually, John, John Murphy, yes, John Murphy, feel free to just basically just add a, a more detailed question so we understand exactly what you're looking for. Sorry for this. Um, actually, I will just skip one question for now because you remember Christy was asking about toxicity in a healthy person and we were not exactly sure the logic of that question. Like she's, she's clarifying in a very useful way here. She's basically saying that, and actually I've been asked myself that question quite a few times. If you give a healthy person too much levodopa so that they, they get more dopamine in the cytosol, what will their symptoms look like? If they get Parkinson's symptoms, your case is supportive. 
if someone who doesn't um, have Parkinson's gets dopamine and gets gets Parkinson's symptoms, then that would support your case. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I think that what you can, um, I mean, uh, it's not a study that I, that I'm thinking of doing is taking a normal and trying to induce Parkinsonism. Um, I, I'd rather take the other approach. I mean, I, I don't think that it's scientifically invalid. It's just not the direct path. So that that's not okay. where I've been headed. But it's an interesting thought. So Ingrid is asking about something slightly different here. You may have an opinion or not, but just to, just in case, she says that her mom uh, basically uh, has Parkinson's and she's been doing research for almost two years. And she's not a big fan of, of the medicines, the medication that she gets at the moment. Um, and she's basically, she started vitamin B5, pantenoic acid, and it seems to be very good. Is this something you would be familiar with? Uh, it's not something that I have familiar with, familiarity no. with, no, I'm sorry. No problem, thank you very much, Nathan. Now, a question here uh, from Albert, right? Hello, Albert. Um, he's asking, is, is the problem of high free DA related to a failure of DA storage vesicles? I do not understand the question myself. I hope it makes sense for you. It makes perfect sense. So good. as I showed you on the complex, <laughs> the complex figure at one point in the middle, um, yes. the, the way a, a neuron protects itself from dopamine mediated toxicity is by packaging it inside these vesicles. The vesicles keep it stable, keep it from breaking down. And then also when a signal comes that they have to pass along, they move over to the membrane at the synapse and release the dopamine into the synapse. So that's what the, um, uh, these vesicles, these storage vesicles, which are driven largely by the protein VMAT2 do in the normal setting. And yes, in Parkinson's disease, VMAT2 levels are markedly reduced. Um, and I think that's a big part of the problem as to why dopamine is so much higher within the cytosol. Even without that, it's certainly not depleted on a per cell basis, but with that, it's really the, the elevations go up dramatically. So I think that's a big part. And there are folks um, who are working on drugs that can potentially increase vesicle formation and improve function largely by modulating VMAT2. That would be very a very exciting way to treat dopamine overload in the cytosol, uh, but there really aren't any, any molecules that are even close to going into clinical trials for that mechanism. Not Thank yet. You, Thank you, Jonathan. Actually, a question from Dave and Seder. They're asking if there are other ways to lower the dopamine in your cells than taking the drug we're talking about. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there are. I can, I can come up with a couple of hypotheses. One would be to lower the, drug, lower the synthesis. Another would be to enhance how quickly it's metabolized. Another would be, as we've mentioned before, more vesicles, increase VMAT2. Um, you can also um, think about the DAC protein, uh, which is what's responsible for taking dopamine out of the synaptic cleft and back into the presynaptic axon, and maybe by blocking that function, you prevent the presynaptic axon from overload. I'm not sure that that's a great idea to leave super high levels in the, in the, in the synapse, uh, but I'm just saying, you know, if you're trying to figure out how to reduce dopamine, you just look at all of the factors that are playing a role, and, and you could say any of those are possible. The beauty of, of tyrosine hydroxylase is that we can test it in people, um, and because it's already on the market, at least in the US. And there are two animal models that show it improves cell function, biochemistry, and viability. So you've got a basic science support, as well as all the work done so you can move right into a proof of concept clinical trial. So it's a very efficient approach to take. Thank you, Jonathan. Question from Sarah, hello, Sarah. Uh, she's asking whether you would like to comment on the use of, of tryptophan as a tyrosine hydroxylase inhibitor. Um, it, it seems as though tryptophan is a very, very weak inhibitor of tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, it, there are some data that suggest it can inhibit the enzyme. Um, and, and again, it gets back to the idea of if, if you're going to take, let's say, let, let's just uh, assume that it could work in a person with Parkinson's disease. So it, it gets absorbed, it's tolerated, and it gets into the brain and it acts there. If you're going to take enough to try to attack this mechanism, then you're basically taking the tyrosine. And you have the same risks 
associated with picking the wrong dose. So if you want to try that, um, you know, look, people who are who are affected by a disease can either be desperate or maybe they're sick of standard medicines, whatever the motivation is. The key thing is if you're going to try something like that, don't do it on your own. Do it with a doctor. Make sure you've got a doctor who understands what to look for and how to manage problems if they occur. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it outside of a clinical trial, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm like conservative mainstream medicine kind of guy. So I, I but but that's what I would say. Do it in a clinical trial. Talk to your doctor. Maybe your doctor can do it as part of a of a clinical trial. Um, if they can get access to the drug and they think it makes sense. So we have, thank you very much, Jeff. And two questions, one from Chris and one from Alexander that are alongside the same topic about simultaneous use of L-DOPA and metarosine. So Chris is asking, if metarosine works to stop progression, would you expect that symptomatic treatment like DA for L-DOPA would be contraindicated for simultaneous use with metarosine? And Alexander is asking, so he's basically saying, Thing. So how would the therapy with metarosine actually look like? Would it be given in addition to L-DOPA? So the, the way that negotiation went with the FDA is along these lines. The FDA felt most comfortable with the drug being used in background of, of some dopaminergic therapy, but not high dose. They wanted it to be tested in people with early stage Parkinson's, um, who were taking maybe a couple hundred milligrams of, of levodopa, for example. It, it's, I, I'm willing to do that because I, I think that um, that at least will allow us to learn that it is a drug that is tolerated. And I think that if I were to show up at the, uh, at, at the Michael J. Fox Annual Symposium or the American Association of Neurology and present a paper showing that a dozen people could tolerate doses up to 400 milligrams three times a day of metirosine without worsening Parkinson's, people would freak out, like in a good way. Like, oh my gosh, this how, how could this be? And then uh, the kind of attention and funding that would be necessary to keep going would follow. Um, what I've discussed um, with uh, the advisors that I have in the Parkinson's world is the idea of doing that one study with the, starting that study first, showing the drug is tolerated on the background of the low dose of L-DOPA or dopaminergic agonist. Um, and then starting a study right after, again, in mild patients who are not on any dopaminergic therapy. Um, could the two work together? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that because as I showed you before, L-DOPA or levodopa basically shifts you up the curve of how the receptors are affected. So it could be useful at the beginning. Uh, maybe people need to be on a little L-DOPA to tolerate the tyrosine. Maybe that's what we learn. And then eventually it gets weaned off. Um, I mean, the only way to know is to start doing the trials. Thank you. Uh, Ashwani is asking actually a, a question about some, he basically says, would you have a recommendation for a PD patient who is taking L-DOPA and is not really sure if L-DOPA is helping him at all? Uh, but he's been taking it to, to be safe. Uh, would you recommend, I mean, at the end of the day, that person should speak to his neurologist, but what would be your, your recommendation? I mean, you know, the only, way, the only way I feel comfortable answering questions like that is if I were to have clinical trial data that's relevant to that situation, or yes. I could talk to somebody who's really an expert in Parkinson's disease. And listen, I mean, I've talked to Parkinson's experts who, just so to be completely transparent, I've talked to Parkinson's expert who think I am out of my mind. Mm -hmm. I had one very prominent uh, Parkinson's expert who I read a few papers by, who I wanted to talk to about this, who I couldn't get on the phone. And he worked at a hospital with a friend of mine from a cardiologist. So I had my cardiologist friend call him and say, you know, talk to Jonathan. We got on the phone. He listened to me for a couple minutes. Then he said to me, so you're a cardiologist, right? And I said, yes. He said, maybe you should go back to cardiology. So I, I, I bring that forward because I, I want you to understand that what I'm presenting is not an approach that um, has been embraced by Parkinson's experts that I've spoken with. Um, over time, as I've talked to people over a two, three, four year period, I have people now who didn't really want to discuss it, who say, you know what, this makes sense. We should do this trial. You should do this trial. Um, so 
I don't, even though I am convinced this is going to work and I am convinced I can carry out the studies and work to demonstrate that, um, uh, I, I do want to give you the caveat that uh, people who understand this disease way more deeply than I do, do not think this is a good idea. So when you go mm -hmm. home, be open-minded. But uh, again, until we have clinical trial data, not only can I not answer the question that was posed by yes. this last uh, questioner about what to do about his or her L-DOPA, but we really need to do the clinical trials that tell us what the right answer is. And, and I'm excited that eventually I'm going to get that started and then I'll share the information with you. Thank you, Jonathan. Linda, you had a question along the same lines. I will pass that question because the answer that Jonathan gave is applicable to this situation as well. Trish is asking um, about um, how would basically, uh, I guess, taking metarazine and uh, with or without L-DOPA affect dyskinesia? Uh, I'm a believer with without any scientific data to back up. I mean, I feel like I have good scientific data to back up approaching Parkinson's with this drug as a treatment. I don't have data with this kinesia, but from what I'm reading about what causes it and looking at the parallels for tardive dyskinesia in outside of Parkinson's disease, I think it could help. I mean, again, that's something that we can learn over time um, uh, and, and hopefully not too much time so that I have the answers at a time that's relevant for each of you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Mark is asking, he's basically saying, apologies if I missed something, but why does the metarosine label come with a warning that the drug could worsen PD? Uh, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a pretty straight, straight path to say, if I have a patient who needs dopamine, who needs levodopa, and there's a drug that prevents L-dopa from being made, if I give that drug and shut off that synthetic pathway, inside the neurons, I'm running just from logic, a high risk of that person getting worse. And that's the basis for that warning. It's, it's not even based on data because there, there aren't any. I mean, I, I'll talk to some Parkinson's expert who tell me, oh, you know, we did this, we gained materacine and it caused Parkinsonism in this clinical trial. It's like, I, I read that paper. Your paper doesn't say that. Hmm. It doesn't say you gave materacine. It doesn't say it caused, there was Parkinsonism that was induced. Like, can you share some data with me? It's like, oh, uh, I have to find it. It's an mm -hmm. old paper. Uh, there just isn't, there, there aren't data to support that statement, but I think it's a very reasonable statement to have on a label considering the mechanism of the drug and the mechanism as we understand it of the disease. Thank you, Jonathan. We still have a few more questions. I hope you have a time for another eight questions. We have had like close Let's to 30, 35 questions, which shows a, a very strong interest for, for your topic here. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking about uh, Mao B razagaline, razagaline, basically saying if dopamine is toxic to cells, how could Mao B razagaline have shown indications of neuroprotection as one milligram dose? Do we just assume that the Mao B neuroprotection trend was actually a false finding since after all it hasn't been reproduced? I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I know exactly which study you're talking about, but um, th there's been a lot of a lot of um, papers where neuroprotection is discussed. Um, I think that many of them relate to how washout is done and then repeat PET or DAT scanning is, is performed. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's not a paper that I've seen, and, I've, and I think I've read enough to say this with confidence, although it's, I mean, it's not like I've read every paper in Parkinson's, uh, but I have not seen a paper that has any evidence showing that the clinical course is changed with any of these dopaminergic therapies. Now, if somebody has a paper, please bring it forward because if I'm wrong about that, then that's an important thing for me to know and certainly undermines a lot of uh, my enthusiasm for what I presented to you today. Mm -hmm. Question from an anonymous attendee who is asking about dopamine that is produced in the gut. Is it something you've looked at? Yeah, really important question. Um, because of how interesting it is physiologically and also how relevant it is to Parkinson's disease, I have not looked at that at all. Okay, interesting topic, we'll keep it in mind. Um, Anne Payton is asking about evidence about herbal verbascoside as TH inhibitor. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that question and, and I, I don't know that that compound. Uh, but I think I would, I would say the same thing about um, that compound as any. If you're looking at a compound, a, a, which is essentially a drug, whether you want to call it a dietary supplement or a vitamin mm -hmm. or whatever, it's a drug because it's going to be affecting the tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme function then you need to be careful because I think that to get benefit, you have to slowly increase your antagonism of that enzyme, your inhibition of that enzyme, but get to a point where you're really meaningfully inhibiting that enzyme. And whether you do it with tyrosine hydroxylase or you invent a new drug or you've got an herbal supplement that does it, um, I, I don't think that the risk for any of them is different if you are using a dose with the same potency against the enzyme. That's what's mm -hmm. going to affect both the likelihood of benefit and the likelihood of harm. Thank you. Uh, Joran is asking about anti-nausea medications that are blocking levodopa. Is it something you've come across? Uh, a lot of the drugs that I think you're referring to are ones that act at the dopamine receptors rather than at the synthesis, uh, the rate limiting enzyme of the synthesis of dopamine. Mm. So it would be different. And part of how I started this, I actually started out looking for which uh, receptor I wanted to block because I was being very literal and trying to use the parallel from heart failure, blocking a cell surface receptor there. I thought that's what I would do with dopamine. Uh, what I found is the distribution of dopamine receptors presynaptically and postsynaptically and elsewhere in the brain is to me far more complicated than what I experienced with beta receptors in the heart. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't figure out a, a way either before I even looked for a drug, I couldn't even figure out a way to affect those enzymes the way I wanted to, to reduce presynaptic dopamine. Mm -hmm. um, and then I said, well, let me see how it's formed. I'll attack the rate limiting enzyme and ended up uh, going ahead and, and finding um, uh, uh, the, this drug. Thank you. Question from Randy about that scans. He's basically asking, uh, can you see that question about uh, tracer, dopamine tracer that scans, whether they, if they show the diminished dopamine in the neuron, how does that correspond with your findings? Well, the, the, the problem we have with uh, imaging, uh, in vivo imaging of the brain, whether it be DAD or PET, is that you can't get the resolution to see what's going on in the cells. You're seeing in reissue. So um, while it's, it's interesting and important, it does not get into the issue of how much dopamine is inside the cells versus in the neighborhood. Thank you. A great question, actually a great comment here from Kevin McFarthing, if you see it, because actually Kevin is our next speaker in a month's time. So we basically, uh, you are meeting one of your colleagues, so to speak. Um, he's, he's giving you the link to the study, but I will also make sure, Kevin, if you agree, that I will be putting both of you in touch after this call. Um, Ingrid is asking whether you are aware of any experts in the UK who are open-minded to the type of treatment you are contemplating. Um, I have not really been, been uh, I'm just starting to really expand beyond that initial set of docs, but uh, I, I'm not sure that I would, even if I had somebody, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable telling you until they decided to advertise it. Mm -hmm. um, and the kinds of people that I'm looking for are people who would be likely to say, I want to participate in this clinical trial. I want to help you design the clinical trial. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking for people who are clinical trial focused because that's what I want to do to, to demonstrate yay or nay. Perfect. Kevin, thank you for, for being very happy to be connected to Jonathan. Uh, Albert had a follow-up question on the DA, 3DA. is asking whether you would expect that reducing dietary L-tyrosine might help reduce the excessive 3DA. I think the likelihood is, is not um, because there's still going to be enough in your body that's going to figure out how to take what's there and, and, and make L-dopa. Thank you very much. And the last question for the day, I think, because we have uh, we, we have plenty of time, but we have been going for quite almost like an hour and a half now, um, is a, a question from Mark, who is asking, what would the dopamine holiday look like? So I think the, the, the best way um, to think about that would be to go back and, and do some searches on the internet to find how people would do it. I'm not sure exactly um, exactly how people prescribe to do it. I do know that when I've talked to Parkinson's experts, they tell me that the idea of a of a of an L-dopa dopamine holiday is something that is not viewed 
as in the patient's best interest. And I don't know if that's because what people have found is that when you stop and restart, that it doesn't work as well. I think the theory initially was that when you stop and restart, it works better. Um, but it's not something I know enough about in the nuances that I think you'd have to discuss that with your neurologist. And if your neurologist is over 50, she or he would probably know pretty well what a dopamine holiday looks like. Thank you very much. And I think I will take this last question from Kevin uh, Kretschy, um, and then we will basically uh, close the session for today. He's asking you whether in your dream clinical trial, what kind of symptoms and side effects would you hope to be measuring accurately, such as the famous, famous UPDRS objective you know, measurement of movement? Yeah, I think that you know, in a phase two study, basically what you're doing is you're testing which endpoints are gonna be the most sensitive to detect the effects you're looking for as you plan for phase three. So the UPDRS is definitely gonna be part of it. Um, one of the things that uh, has frustrated me about the way Parkinson's is investigated and written about, um, especially after watching Ivan, my friend, is that he had a lot of trouble moving around and, and that used to really frustrate him. And what strikes me about clinical trials in Parkinson's is that I can't find one where people have actually measured how well people can get around. If, if you want to say that I'm going to try to treat the movement disorder grossly, then I think one of the endpoints in a phase two trial should be how much a person walks or how quickly a person can get out of a chair and walk. There's something called the timed up and go test. So I'm going to include a few of those things as well as looking at overall activity by having people wearing something called an actigraph that traces their movements over the course of a week period. So you really see whether they're able to move more. Um, and, and I think those would be very interesting endpoints in addition to all those that are typically measured in clinical trials. Jonathan, thank you very, very much for your time today and for an extremely thought stimulating session. I wish you the best of luck with raising the necessary funding to the, for, the, for the trial that you, that you want to launch. Um, I will basically be calling you and just try to see whether we can connect you with some of our partners and see whether something comes out of it. I would also like to thank our audience today who basically counted more than 100 people and was extremely active with close to 40 questions, which is really uh, basically an all time high. So that really shows a very clear sign of interest from everyone. Thank you everyone for this. And then we'll be meeting again in a month's time for Kevin McCarthy, who will be talking to us uh, about uh, some very interesting topics about the new, new trials and therapies that, uh, that can be of interest to everyone. Thank you all of you and uh, we'll see each other in a month's time. Thank you, Jonathan. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.